great tune. Mississippi Sawyer. That is going to be our tune that we focus on today in the month of April 2022. We got five episodes in this month with five tunes for different skill levels. And it's just going to be a lot of fun. Mississippi Sawyer today, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an old chestnut alert. And uh, thank you for joining me on Dulce America. My name is Bing Futch. This is one of the tunes, one of the first tunes I started playing in the jams. Unbeknownst to me, I had gotten a very simplified version of it and then began jamming in other places and realized there were a lot of notes missing. So uh, I'm going to bridge the gap, hopefully, in this episode, geared towards our intermediate level performers out there. I'm going to take a very simple version of Mississippi Sawyer and then add back in some of the notes that have been strained out over the years for Mountain Bellsburg players. And uh, it's really a lot of fun. We'll talk some more about that later on. But in order to follow along the best way, you want to have the music in front of you. So you can go right down here to my Patreon open house and download the music for Mississippi Sawyer and follow along. Uh, if you don't have a way of doing that, I will be putting some of the music up on the screen. But it really would be a good idea for you to have that in front of you. So even if you have to pause the video and come back to it later on, uh, so you can really see what's going on with the melodies, the harmonies, and of course the rhythms. So let's look at that music and see what the basics that we're dealing with are. First of all, we are in DAD tuning. And we are in the key of D major. F sharp and C sharp are on the staff. We are in 4-4 four, four time, so there are four beats in the measure. The quarter note gets the beat. And as you can see, we have got an A section and a B section. Typically, old-time tunes go twice through the A section and twice through the B section, and that's definitely going to happen here. You can see we have repeat symbols, those dots at the beginning of measure one, and also those dots are at the end of measure eight. That indicates we're going to play measures one through eight, and then we're going to repeat measures one through eight, and we just do that once. So we're going to play the A part two times. Then we move on to the B section. Once again, there are those repeat symbols in measure 9 at the beginning. Those repeat symbols are at the end of measure 16. So we're playing measures 9 through 16 once, and then going back to measure 9 and playing 9 through 16 again. That's it. No first or second endings, nothing really uh, tricky. Just two times through the A part and two times through the B part. Now, taking a look at the melody. Typically, when I put tab together, I don't like to put zeros on the bass string line and on the middle string line to indicate drone, because it just kind of clutters up visually what you're looking at. So understand here that even though you're seeing melody written on the, mel on the melody string only, uh, there's nothing on the middle string or bass string, you can go ahead and play that melody against the drone, since we are in the key of D, and the drone is our home drone. E.T. home drone. Anyway. Um, so we're playing through there, and then when you get to measure number three, you'll see that we are adding some notes on the middle string for harmony for that G major chord. Once again, go ahead and play open zero on the bass string and drone that on, and it'll sound fine because D, of course, is inside of G major. You'll know that when we're playing a whole different chord, we're going to have a stack of numbers, like you see in measure number seven, one on one chord, and then we're holding that one on the bass string, we're holding the zero, not touching it, we're not changing it on the middle string. But notice we are playing some melody on the melody string, going from one to two to three, back down to two. As far as our note durations and rhythms, we've got mostly quarter notes and eighth notes. We have a couple of half notes at the end of each uh, section. And there are a couple of additional half notes in the B part on page two. So as we learned last week with the Boatman, uh, whenever we see a clear note, half notes or whole notes, notes that are extended longer uh, than a uh, beat and a half really, that's where we need to bring in extra rhythm. And we'll handle that during the second half of the uh, uh, look here at this tune. But we only have a few of those. Otherwise, this piece moves along in a pretty decent clip. And uh, that is the rhythm. The melody is providing us the rhythm and the movement of the piece. So let's go ahead from the first measure here. 
And we have our rhythm one, two, and three, four, and one, two, three, four, one, two, and three, four, and one, two, three, four. So it's got this on and off rhythm. Bum ba da dum ba da dum bum 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 ba da dum ba da dum bum bum bum. It goes back and forth between being straight fours and then having a little bit of a mixture between the quarter notes and the eighth notes. Very very fun. It's going to get very very interesting when we start putting those extra notes back in there or the missing notes back in there. So watch my fingers, and we're going to walk through now, just measure by measure. I'm going to start off, and I'm using primarily the thumb, index finger, and the middle finger in groupings like this. But I use other fingers sometimes uh, where the need arises. So coming from the very, very first measure here, we're going to start off on four. <laughs> So, now I'm going to slide the thumb down to three, and I'm going to use my index finger on one on the middle string, middle finger on one on the melody string, and at measure three, do this. Okay, so we've gone from our D major. our G major. So we're playing chords, harmonies, we've got that melody that we're playing on top of everything. And then we're going to measure five. Okay, and then we get to our A at measure seven, 101, and then... Using my thumb there to ride that melody. Now repeat. Okay, now we move on to the B part. The B part, we've got one, two, and three, four, and one, two, three, four for our first phrase. That takes us into measure 11. Measure 13. Measure 15. That's credits. Remember credits from last week? We've already learned that section in the A part in measure 7, measure 8. And so measures 7 and 8 are the exact same as measures 15 and 16. Nice, huh? All right. Let's play that again. That's uh, the second time through, the B part. walkthrough of all of the things that we need to put our fingers on and the basic rhythms. I didn't put any extra rhythms in there, just the rhythm that the melody is providing for us. Now once again, melody is king and melody is giving us the rhythm that's going to drive the piece. And as long as we're doing one strum per melody note, then we've got that rhythm already built in. We don't have to come up with a rhythm. It's already built in to the tune. Now, it's when that melody sustains for longer than a beat and a half or so that we need to step in and do a little something to keep the subdivisions moving so that people want to get up and boogie. So I want me show you how I do that again. Typically, it's only as much as I need to before the melody kicks back in. So oftentimes, I'll just come back against the bass string. Very, very, very easy, simple counterpoint move to keep things moving. So I'll go slow first and just see how I kind of add these things in. Here we go. one right there. 
only one time during the eight bar do I actually add any sort of additional rhythm. And I do that where these big old clear notes are hanging out because the melody uh, basically at that point is dun 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 dun, dun Sawyer. I think that's the line right there. Um, we've got two half notes, two beats each. One, two, three, four. So there's a lot of space there and we could leave it that dum dee dee ding dum bum bum. Uh, you know, that's not that's not a lack of rhythm. It's not as rhythmic and as busy as it was prior, but that could definitely be just a bookend, and I think dancers probably could manage to do that. Two simple moves. But I sometimes feel the need to get in there and do a little something, so what I'm doing basically is treating those half notes as quarter notes. I hit them, and then instead of playing the half note for two quarter notes, I'm hitting the half note as one quarter note, and then I'm doing a quarter note pulse, a counterpoint beat on the bass, and then getting that second half note, I'm playing that as a quarter note, and then adding another quarter note for that beat on the bass. Let me play it again from measure seven to eight. So at the very, very least, we've got four beats that you can hear and that you can feel. Dum, de dee, ding, ding, bum, 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 bum. And that four beats is enough to kind of keep your time at it. Like I said, it's not a deal breaker. Doing two half notes will be just fine in most cases. Uh, most people can kind of, most dancers worth their salt can subdivide through two half notes, no problem. But I sometimes just do it for my own groovy purposes, I guess. So you can do it or you can not do it. It's completely up to you. Um, now, the B part, there are other parts here where I kind of think it's really necessary to kind of keep things rolling in a certain way. And again, with the half notes, really all I'm gonna be doing is one quarter note bass beat, okay? So let's go in now to the uh, B part. Let's go ahead and see how that's gonna work out. There's the bass, <laughs> although I, I, I air uh, balled it, let me go. Okay, and then there's another bass note coming off the tail end of that last half note in measure 12. There's another quarter note bass pulse on uh, beat 4 of measure 14, and then to wrap. And there it is again. So there's not a lot of extra something something you can throw into this tune. You could do more and be kind of crazy about it. Um, so let me just speed it up a little bit and uh, see if, because what happens is I play slow and I'm more uh, conservative with what I throw into a piece of music. When I'm going faster, it feels like I can get away with more and throw more in there. So let's just kind of see what goes on if I pick up the pace just a little bit. One, two, three, four. Sorry. I didn't do any counterpoint on the two half notes at the end in measure 16 because at that point I've actually come to the end of the tune one time through and it's kind of nice to give me or give anybody rather a little bit more breathing room there and just play the half notes as written clear the room a bit and then boom we jump right back into it for our second time around now let's talk about the notey version and what is this whole thing about notey versus the dulcimer version uh, and when I say dulcimer, I'm, I'm talking at this point about mountain dulcimers. Mountain dulcimers and hammer dulcimers have uh, been grouped together because they share the word dulcimer in their name. The instruments are completely different. And it's a lovely, lovely fellowship that we have for certain. But, you know, 
Hammer dulcimers have got a lot more notes than we do, a lot more strings, and so they tend to play uh, tunes closer to the original versions, whereas mountain dulcimer players, we have some limitations for whatever reasons that we get these, uh, these chilled out versions of tunes where a lot of the notes are removed to make it easier to play. Now I'm all for accessibility. At the same time, I'm all for uh, not selling anybody short and saying, you, you're not uh, sophisticated enough or skilled enough to play all the notes, so let's just give you two. <laughs> you know? So, that said, I wanted to give you the simple version because this is what you're going to run into a lot when you're out in the jam. But you might also hear some dulcimer players playing along with the fiddles and the banjos and mandolins and other people who are doing all the other notes. Now, there are many different versions out there. And so if you are learning a piece of music and you really want to distill the essence of what the melody is, my suggestion is to go on to YouTube or on Spotify, on uh, Pandora, look up, make a playlist of tons and tons of different people playing that one song. Listen to them all and find out what they all have in common. You'll be able to tell at that point, especially if you know the entertainers who are playing, you, you'll be able to tell if this is like really over the top notiness that they're adding to it because they're being, you know, awesome and cool. You'll be able to listen to it also and go, hmm, this is a simplified version because it's not as noty as this version here. And, you know, you can kind of pick out the, your favorite version. There's nothing wrong with playing less noty versions, but it's always nice to know that there is this other alternative and that you too can play all of the notes. So let's first take a look at the opening and the A part. We've already pretty much got everything from the beginning. Sometimes there's a little extra doom data. That second uh, A, the second A in measure two, I'll double that up. You might have actually heard me make that eighth notes while I was strumming. You know, that's not terribly intense, but uh, there will be little changes like that here and there. Uh, getting down to our G. There's another changing of uh, the eighth notes there. Um, and then we go. Uh, now, here's where the first change is. Measure number five is written like this. That's measures five, six, seven, and eight. Now, this is the way that it's been played time immemorial, basically. Um, okay, those are the notes. Two, two, three, two, one, oh, one, two, three, four. Then go. And then get into your A, get your two on the middle string. So it's a one, two, one I'm doing there. So I get into that A pretty early. Use the thumb to grab the uh, C sharp on the middle string. I'm gonna do that one more time. Huh. And then there's a little that I like to do going back and forth there. All right, now we do that twice A part. So we have our new extended notey section there. Uh, it starts at measure five. Okay, now we get into the B part. So there's that run again that we just did. So it's sort of credits. I've also heard people go. come back down to open D on the melody string. Then on 11, instead of going uh, is the hardest part of the song that I've 
come across, and that is uh, coming from the B part now. Okay, now, go into your 101 chord, open, thumb gets two on the middle, whatever finger you want to gets one on the middle, holding on to that one the whole time, because we're supposed to be in the A chord, then open on the middle, one, up, two, three, okay, or instead of three, you could go open melody, Come back into your 101 with the one, the melody string. Go two, three, back down to two, back down to one. That's kind of fun, a little boomerang action going on there. Let's do that again. thing about that is that everything exists within the chord shape in this first three fret range so you don't have to go running up and down the fretboard that's kind of cool one more time and then we put that tag on our credits at the end of the B part See, that wasn't so bad. It's not terribly noty, but there is a lot more action going on there. And uh, like I said with the Boatman last week, uh, I started playing some of these simple versions and then going out to other jams where they were playing the noty versions and they were like, what are you doing? So I just decided at an early point after my first jam that I was going to start learning those noty versions. And I would teach both versions and give people the option of which one they wanted to play. So. With all of our notiness and feel, I'm going to go ahead and play this a couple times around again and just kind of let go with it and, um, and see what happens. I love playing this tune, but I also do a lot of other crazy stuff with it. So here's a demonstration of that. M, I, crooked letter, crooked letter, I. <clears throat> that is Mississippi Sawyer, and um, <laughs> I'm not even sure what to do with that next, but it's a fun tune. It's one of the more popular chestnuts out there, and uh, they do show up, these chestnuts, quite often. So this is one that, if you learn it, you can be guaranteed that you will be utilizing it sometime, somewhere soon, in the in-person jams. Now that we're going back out and playing in-person jams again. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you guys so much for following along. Enjoy uh, playing the tune out. Enjoy the rest of what we have to offer this month in Dulce America. Coming up next week, an advanced level tutorial on a tune that I wrote back in 1987. And uh, we'll get into a different time signature and have some fun with a different tuning as well. And I'll introduce you to this tune from way, way, way back. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next week.
Mississippi Waltzer. 